it's that I am pulling at the dress up to a bigger trade show. <laughs> um, okay, so let's kick off. Um, I would like to introduce to you Shane Clark. Um, I have known Shane professionally um, for about 23, 24 years now. Shane's been in the pest control industry for 35 years. He started as a training technician in his father's, father's business called uh, Pest Force, based at Round Corner near Dural. So he started as a technician uh, in 1985 and then from 1990 became manager and basically eventually took over the business until a few years ago. Shane's business has always specialised in termites and he developed um, the safety net um, termite management strategy and more recently was responsible for de developing the dog wall, which is basically a wall that trains dogs to sniff termites. Um, so he uses them to, yeah, for termite detection, which he's so well known for. He has very much of a hands-on approach when it comes to termites and likes to use dogs to solve um, chronic termite problems. Between 1999 and 2008, Shane was commissioned by the New Zealand Biosecurity, um, that's the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in New Zealand, to manage four separate termite incursions on the North and South Island. Um, basically, they had a termite issue, four incursions, um, through power poles from Australia being imported into New Zealand and creating termite problems. So those nine years, Shane went regularly over to New Zealand and dealt with, yeah, dealt with all those um, four incursions. And he also worked with the entomologist of MAP to help him gain a better understanding of termite biology and behaviour of um, here, here in Australia. Shane has held several um, positions on industry associations, including AEDMA, the Industry Training Advisory Board, and was also involved in the Pest Cert um, Management Committee in 2005. He has worked uh, very closely with Bill Hadlington Research Group and uh, was commissioned by Dow AgroSciences, who uh, we are now called Teva, but we were Dow AgroSciences in the early 90s to basically um, trial and advise on the development of, Centricon, of the Centricon system, which as many of you or some of you may remember was the very first um, termite management system to be introduced in Australia in 1997. So Shane was very much hands-on involved in all that early development work. Um, he has worked, as I mentioned, worked closely with Phil Hadlington and um, and, and many other well-known in, entities in the uh, pest control industry. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Shane to uh, talk about hunting termites. Take it away, Shane. Thank you. And um, thanks everyone, you know, firstly for joining us today. And, um, and it's great. I think we can, um, we can all do this uh, much more often. But Chair, this, I, I started pest control when we were using Claudane and Heptachlor. And um, I'll never forget the first time I did a job and we were drilling holes, we we're pumping stuff all over the place and we did all of that. And then a month after the job, I went out to check the job and there were still termites eating the house. And so, you know, it was a regular thing for those jobs to fail, for termites to continue to attack the building after we'd done the application with Claudine and the like. And so I was looking for answers to this and started working with Phil Hadlington. And he was at the time doing experiments with bait stakes and with dusting bait stakes and, and doing various things to try and get hits on bait stakes. And I had the, um, you know, the fortunate, um, it, was, it was very fortunate that I was able to spend every Thursday morning um, with Phil and his team, you know, for a I think it was two or three years or more um, in the field. You know, these old guys, instead of playing golf, they, uh, they went looking for termites. I went out on jobs with them. Eventually I took my dog, you know, I was their eyes and ears and, and they were hunting termites. Those guys taught me about, you know, the fact that you can find where the colony is and kill the nest. And originally this led to some conflict with my with my dad because he was saying, listen, you're shooting the goose that lays a golden egg. You know, you've got to just use the chemicals, keep them out of the house and work your way down the street. You know, the last thing you want to do is kill the nest. But, you know, this didn't sit right with me because of all of these failures. And so when, um, 
Dow, as it was at the time, came along and said, look, can you um, get involved in this and trial this? I just embraced it, you know, with both hands. And the first thing I immediately said was we need an above ground bait. And of course, you know, these trials were very strictly controlled. And so we had to put in so many stations at so many intervals around the house and very strictly follow these protocols. And um, as time went on, you know, I was finding I wasn't getting the feeding that I needed on the baits. I wasn't getting hits on baits. And so I was mucking around with my own prototypes of above ground baits and working very closely with um, Warwick Lucas at the time to develop an above ground bait. And, um, and it was only when, you know, and these, these were jobs, you've got to understand, these were jobs where Claudine had failed and people's houses were getting eaten. You know, the only um, people that would put themselves up for these trials were people where the traditional methods had failed. And so, you know, I was going in there and we checking the station saying that there's no termites in the station. And, you know, we, we must do more, we must do more. And how are we gonna resolve these problems? Because um, it's my coffee machine turning itself off, sorry. Um, you know, how are we going to, um, how are we going to make this work? Because clearly what I was doing was not, in my mind, effective enough. And so I was trying to find areas within the building. And the first feeding I ever achieved on an above ground bait was um, in a header beam, above a header beam on an external wall. And I'd lifted roof tiles to find the termites in that, in that header beam and place the um, place the above ground bait and um, and we got feeding on the bait and so then I you know turned my mind to making the in-ground stations work um, much better and and it the idea of hunting termites with Centricon first came from a Dow video that I saw of uh, the Americans using it. And this American guy was on there saying, well, I'm a hunter and, and you know this, what I love about this product is it enables me to hunt termites just like I, I hunt everything else in my spare time, you know? And I was sitting out in my boat and um, not catching any fish. And um, a trawler went past, a professional fisherman went past. And I thought, you know what? I'm hunting termites like an amateur. I'm like the kid on the jetty with a hand line and I'm not catching much, you know, on my trial sites. And, and I was significantly, you know, I was really worried about it. I was having sleepless nights, you know, I'm, I'm trialing this new product and the termites are flying out of the walls. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it was highly traumatic. And, um, and it, it came to me that I was fishing for termites like an amateur. I was, the kid on the, I was the kid on the end of the jetty and I thought what I need to do is start systematically hunting for termites. And so I got right on the front foot and um, decided that um, because the in-ground stations weren't getting the hits, we, we did a trial, right? We ran a trial and it took me back to uh, Phil Haddington's days with his bait stakes and he was doing trials. He put a bait stake in and he put a little wing beside the bait stake. It was only about a foot long. And he maintained that that dramatically increased the hits on his bait stakes. And so I took the same idea to Centricon and we ended up putting in 1200 stations with a one meter core flute wing attached to the station. 1200 stations in, in, in 12 months, right? And um, beside those wing stations, we had a, another station which had no wing. And um, we found that the hits on the station with the wing was 600% higher or greater probability than the station without the wing. And so, you know, it's, it, it occurred to me that this is in, incredibly effective. And so rather than just doing a ring of stations around the house, I started putting in a lot more stations and I started digging these trenches and try to guide the termites to the stations. And I started thinking very carefully about where the above ground baits were going and how they were being installed and started thinking about the equipment, just like my tackle box in my fishing boat, you know, and you can have all the best tackle, 
But if you can't find the fish, you're not going to catch any. And it's exactly the same with termites. And so I um, started digging trenches. You know, I'd go to jobs and take a tractor and dig a trench and fill the trench with mulch and line the trench with stations. And I very quickly realised that, yes, the ring of stations around the house is good. But if you really get on the front foot and go hunting for these termites, you will catch an awful lot more, an awful lot more termites. It also became obvious, you know, with my staff, I had to change the mentality because they would go out to jobs and they would say, and it was put on the paperwork, you're going out to check this job. You go out and check the stations. Just go and check the stations. And then I'd see these jobs where, you know, I'm looking at the reports, I'm reviewing the jobs, they're going out, they're checking the stations. There's no termites feeding. Going out, they're checking the stations. There's still no termites feeding. Next month, they're going back, they're checking the stations. There's still no termites feeding. Well, what are you doing to get the termites feeding on the bait? You know, what are you doing to find the termites that you can catch? So we, um, of course, use dogs to locate termites, to um, find more areas to feed. But I started changing the mentalities. So we said, well, instead of saying we're going out to check the baits, we're not going out to check the baits. We're going out there to, to service the termite management system. And so straight away, every opportunity to put more stations in the ground, every opportunity to bring more termites into contact with Centricon, obviously the greater the effectiveness of the system would be. And so, you know, it's a, hot, it's a cold, hard reality that if the termites aren't feeding on the stations, they're going to be feeding somewhere. And if you're just going back and you're looking, and especially with some species like Coptotermes French eye, where they're so, they're so cryptic, they're so hard to find, you know, so often you look and you don't see live termites, you just see some evidence or you just see some damage. It can be so tricky to, to get them feeding on the bait. And it, it requires a certain amount of skill um, to get them feeding on the bait, to find the appropriate place to put that station and to bring termites into contact with Centricon because there's nothing magical about it. You know, this is not like a, a prescriptive thing. It's not like, as I say, it's not like baking a cake where we follow the same recipe, we put it in the oven and out comes a cake, right? This, if it was as simple as that, they would sell it in Bunnings, right? And let the homeowners just do it themselves. If it was just a matter of bunging these things in the ground and forgetting about it, they would sell it in Bunnings, right? Now, the reason they sell it to professional pest managers only is because it does require this skill. It does require us to go hunting for termites. And so I maintain that the basic installation, and the manual does describe this, where it says that, you know, you've got to put a minimum of one station every three metres around the building. Now, that is a commencement point. That is where you start. All right. But then each time we go to that property, conditions will be changing. You know, homeowners do gardening, you see more things on site, you, you, um, the conditions change. And so a, a termite management system should be constantly fluid and moving, you know, and, and growing and progressing. Stations need to be removed, stations need to be added, investigations on trees need to be done, access needs to be made, roof tiles have to be lifted, areas of concealed termite activity have to be found. Um, tests have to be carried out to find concealed activity so that we can introduce those termites to, to Centricon. And all of those things are absolutely critical to having success. Now, I know that um, a lot of people in the industry criticise me and, and would say that I was over-servicing properties. They would say that you know, I was charging a lot of money. And that's true. But the fact is that 
if I am there, you know, constantly looking for areas to bait, constantly detecting new outbreaks of termite activity, well then, you know, it's, it's, it's much more likely that I'm gonna find the activity instead of the client, which of course keeps things on, a, on an even keel. And it allows me to adjust the baiting on site to, ch to meet the, the changing conditions um, that, that, that are occurring. It allows me to detect the water leaks. It allows me to keep reminding the client to lower the gardens, to improve the ventilation. Every single visit we go there is an opportunity to find something more to do, to hunt for termites. So that's the mentality that we all have to adopt to be successful um, with this kind of termite management. It's not good enough to install a ring of stations around the house and then just trust. And, and it often, uh, admittedly, it does often occur just so beautifully. You put a ring of stations around the house, the termites eat some bait and the problem goes away and they never return. And we all think, oh, wow, that's so easy. You know, that's such easy money, isn't it? But that's not how it works, you know, every time. And from my experience, it's common to have multiple termite colonies attacking the one house, all right? It's common for the colony to be within the house. And so you put a ring of stations around the house and then everyone's thinking, well, why aren't there termites feeding on my bait? Well, the fact is they're not out there. They're in the house or they're under the house. And the reason they're not going into your stations is because the colony is within the structure. It happens a lot. And so, you know, each time we go to the property, we are looking for new areas of activity. I'd be inspecting those houses four times a year, every three months, looking for new areas of activity. And it was worthwhile we would find stuff, all right? And, and we would, you know, be able to respond to that before it became a, a catastrophe. So by going out there, by using thermal imaging technology, by using Termatrack, by using moisture meters, by using detection dogs, by using our own peepholes, the most and, and by using our brain, you know, we look at the site and we say, well, where is the water going? Where are the most likely sources of termites? What is the history? Has there been previous chemical applications carried out on this site? Because as we know, a lot of these chemicals, especially the modern ones, will affect termite behavior and it will affect the performance. If termites aren't behaving normally, they're not feeding normally. And if they're not feeding normally, then getting them to consume Centricon is gonna be tricky. And, you know, I go out to sites and people say, look, it hasn't worked. And, and the stations are too close to the building and they're in chemically treated soil. You know, I've seen stations in concrete next to drill holes where people have been injecting chemicals and clearly, it's, it's, it's not gonna work. So we have to take all of these things into consideration. We have to look at the slope of the land. We have to look at, has the site been cleared recently? Is it a budding bushland? Are there water issues? Um, you know, was there previously a peach orchard on this site? You know, and we've got a colony every 12 feet where the peach trees were. Um, all of these things have to be taken into consideration. And we have to get away from the idea that, you know, um, if we just bait the termites or we just introduce termites to central economy and we eliminate the colony, that's not enough. We still have to make access. We still have to remove formwork. We still have to address the structural conditions that are conducive to termite activity. We still have to do all of the basic things we've always done in termite management. We still have to look for the nest. And, you know, Phil Hadlington's mantra was always the first priority is to find the nest. And the first priority is to 
kill the colony. Because, you know, if we simply have no termites on site, well, there is no termite risk. There is no termite problem. The termite problem is gone once we remove the termites from the site. And so, you know, when I look at the history of using chemicals to keep termites out of the, out of the building, and then I look at what we've achieved with Centricon in managing termites, I can tell you the success rate is much, much higher um, using this approach combined with Centricon uh, than using even organochlorine chemicals like Chlordane, just trying to keep termites out of the building. And I even go so far as to say that any use of chemicals on that site is to be avoided. If, if I've got a site and I can see where termites are gaining visible entry to the building, the last thing I would do is apply chemicals to stop termites gaining visible entry to the building. Because I know that all roads lead to Rome. And even if we kill that colony, another colony can come along. And I've seen it many times where the same stations, the same in-ground stations, the same above-ground stations get hit a decade after the original infestation has been removed. And it's something that, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the entomologists within the sciences um, told us wouldn't happen, but it did. Termites invade each other's galleries and they use each other's you know, workings to get into a house. So if we've got termites gaining visible entry over a slab edge, the very last thing we wanna do is to apply chemicals and make them invisible. Because if the next colony comes along, you know, at the same moment that we can see that visible lead coming over the edge of the slab, there might be a very small, tiny lead coming through a joint in the slab or through a shower penetration in the slab we don't know about. And if we close off that visible entry point, the termite activity is just going to increase in the concealed areas. And if we, even if we eliminate the colony and then we apply that chemical barrier, any future infestation that follows those galleries, they're going to come to that house and they're going to obviously not gain concealed entry, they're gonna gain concealed entry through the slab, through one of these other areas. And so I say, I don't like to remove, you know, any evidence of termites gaining visible entry to the property. That to me is gold. So when I take on a termite problem, I wanna find as many nests as I can. I wanna find as much visible evidence within the building as I can. And so, yeah, I'll lift carpets, I'll lift, move insulation, I'll move roof tiles, I'll drill holes and look with my bore scope, I'll run my dogs through the property, I will use the Termatrack device, I will do everything possible to know exactly where every single termite is walking within that property. And then I will design the in-ground system to put around that house and I take the attitude that the larger the property is, the more I can do. And the larger the property is, the better the level of control is likely to be because it means that I can put more stations in the ground. On highly limited sites like um, terrace houses where we can't put baits all around the structure, it's incredibly, incredibly limited. And those sites for me are more difficult because I can't do as much. But on a bigger site where I can put stations around a five acre property or put a hundred metres of stations down a boundary fence between that property and the, and the forest, well, it's only gonna do good things. The client's gonna ha be happier because they will see value for the money that they're paying. The, the level of control will be higher because we'll get more hits. We'll, we'll know more about, you know, the termite activity that's going on in the ground around the house. And that's really the fundamental issue is that because termites are subterranean, we don't know they're there until they come out of the ground and eat something. And usually that something is something we want and that's why we notice them. And so by using Centricon to systematically track termite activity on that site, 
then we can achieve a level of control that goes way beyond anything else that's out there. It goes way beyond any kind of um, chemical that you put around the house. And so, you know, I like to keep my tackle box full, for sure. But to catch the fish, you've got to find them. And it's exactly the same with termite management. You know, I think of the, the house like the boat. I think of the, the central constations like my crab pots or like, you know, fishing lines that I put out. And if I can use a net, well, mate, you'll catch more if you use a net and if you use a line. So, you know, that's the approach we need to take with, um, with Centricon. We need to um, really hunt hard for termites. We need to be fully aware of the species that are active in our local area where we're working. We need to adjust our techniques to make sure that um, we're finding every opportunity we can. You know, and often um, I've had staff say to me, well, you know, I, it's all right, they're feeding. I can relax now. The termites are feeding. And I'd say to them, well, fine, they're feeding there. But what else is going on? Is there another colony? And I have seen Shedderinotermes on one side of the wall stud and Coptotermes on the other side of the wall stud. And so two AGs had to be installed. No, to, uh, it, so it just because they're feeding is we don't relax. We hunt and we hunt hard and we get on the front foot and we make no assumptions. We don't assume that just because we've found a colony in a tree that it's the nest, as we hear so many people say, I found the nest. No, you found a nest. And how can we tell if it's the nest? You know, we see it again and again. I go to sites and they say, well, I found the nest. The termites are still eating the house. <laughs> Sorry, but it's not the only nest. You know, I go to sites where they assume they've found the entry point. But of course, then I do a search with my dog and I find, well, there's another three entry points that you were unaware of. There's termite activity in these other sections of the building that people are completely unaware of and totally not detecting. And the only reason they're not detecting it is because they're not looking. They're not spending the time. And so it's critical, you know, I would annoy all of my staff and many customers because once I'd get on a termite job, I don't carry a clock. I don't carry a clock and the phone is in the car. And I am purely on that termite job. I'm purely looking for entry points. I'm looking for opportunities to install more Centricon. And I'm looking for potential risks. Because I know it's like, um, you know, I was questioning Phil Hadlington on the, the logic of, well, what's the point of looking for the nests, Phil? We've got bushland sites. There's probably 20 colonies within striking distance of this house. And he, he just turned and looked at me and he said, well, Shane, if there's 20 nests around that house and you can find 10 of them, you've reduced the risk by half. And it's a very simple, it's a very simple thing, isn't it? If there are less termite colonies, there is less risk to the house. And so, you know, we have to get away from this idea that we just follow a label or, you know, drill holes or do things, you know, like I said, baking a cake. We've got to think of this like a hunter and we've got to go after these termites and we've got to find them and we've got to remove them from the property. And so when I had clients saying to me, well, listen, Shane, this other guy says he's going to install this barrier system and he's going to give me a 10 year warranty and we will never get termites again. I say to them, well, listen, if you've got somebody coming in and robbing your house, right? And fundamentally, this is what the termites are doing. If you've got somebody coming in, robbing your house, what do you want to do? Do you want to do, you know, do you want to build a fence to try and keep those out of the house? 
Or do we just want to kill them and have them not ever be a problem ever again? And so with termite management, the fortress approach is going to fail. Just like a fly screen will invariably one day get a hole in it and the bugs will come in. The same applies with the fortress approach with a chemical application to the soil around the building. But by hunting termites, by not contaminating the environment, by actually using the termites behavior, by taking on like here are the conditions conducive, well, let's bait those areas. That's where they're gonna be. By finding those termites and by introducing the, um, by introducing Centricon at every opportunity, we're able to thin out those termite colonies and remove those termite colonies and reduce the risk. One of the first jobs where this became apparent was actually at the Australian Museum. And that had a problem with termites that had gone on for two and a half decades. And we were brought in, there's damage everywhere, evidence all over the place, damage everywhere. And um, the, we went through with my dog and, um, and um, he, he indicated six areas in the skeleton section of that building. And we installed above ground stations purely on spec. Within a month, I had five of those were actively feeding on termites. And the activity was resolved and there hasn't been activity since. That's what hunting termites is about. It's about predicting where they're gonna go. It's about detecting them in the bottom of the, in the wall header and putting the bait on, on the top plate above, even if you can't see anything there. It's about trying new things and modifying new things. And so, you know, it should be a completely flexible, growing and moving thing. And we can't just be complacent, sitting back and waiting for something to happen. We've got to actually make it happen. And, um, you know, that's the way to be successful. That's the way to stop buildings being eaten. But I'm very, very happy um, to answer questions if people have questions or if you want me to um, All right. uh, yeah. Thank, thanks, describe Shane. anything else. Yeah, um, thanks, Shane. That was a very, very uh, brilliant insight into hunting for termites and uh, that it's not just a matter of sticking stations in the ground. So I'm sure everyone would have um, got, taken a, a lot from uh, that presentation then. Um, we do have some answers. So if anybody do, does have a question to ask, please just type into the Q&A down the bottom. Um, now, we've got, um, I can't see, someone's answered, asked a question, Shane. Uh, was it the chemical or the application? And I assume them talking about the Thordane and the Hepcoglob. Ah, uh, well, yeah, look, um, of course. It, 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 it's, it's, it's both. I mean, the fact is that um, when you apply a chemical to the soil, it's only as good as the material you're applying it to. And it doesn't matter if the product lasts a thousand years. If the material you're applying it to isn't appropriate, it's not going to work. It'll have gaps. And so, you know, when, I mean, we gave up drilling holes in concrete slabs for this reason. We cut them all and we'd lift out the concrete and we'd remove all the rubble and then put in appropriate material and then treat that material. But even then, like buildings have the most, you know, um, amazing design problems. And the fact is that with any existing building, no matter what you do when you're applying liquid chemicals to the soil, there will always be gaps. Invariably, there will always be gaps. And um, there's nothing that um, anyone can really do to overcome that. There's invariably, you know, they, they need a 1.6 millimetre gap <laughs> and they're in. And um, the problem 
I see with those chemicals is that they do more to conceal activity that was there rather than actually um, stop it. You know, and I got told I was going out and checking all these jobs and saying, well, you know, if I'm still finding activity. I got told by a service manager at one point to stop looking so hard. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> the fact is that um, it's, it's the, you know, we can screen our houses with fly screens and the like, and invariably you still get bugs in the house. <laughs> it's a foregone conclusion. So... It's, it is the application for sure, but it is also um, the construction or the structural issues um, that, that cause problems. I mean, the chemical might last a thousand years, but if some untreated material is laid down over the top of that uh, treatment, um, the day after it's done, well, the termites will be in. It's, uh, it's like when I see, um, I see pictures of people lifting up painters, applying chemicals and then putting the painters back and immediately bridging the treatment they've just applied. It's just nonsensical. But in, in, invariably, you know, the jobs I see where there's catastrophic damage that's gone on undetected, where somebody's house has been eaten, you know, which is a tragic event. Um, those jobs more often than not um, in my experience, have had chemicals applied. And um, after those chemicals have been applied, activity has continued that hasn't been detected because the chemicals have forced the termites into more concealed areas of the structure. And so that's why I say the last thing I would do is apply chemicals anywhere near that house. I mean, even a you know, if I've got a ring of stations around a building, I'd discourage the client from doing a webbing spider treatment. Um, you know, you certainly want to be, wouldn't want to be using fipronil for ant control around a building that you're managing termites on because it's going to affect the behaviour of the termites. So, yeah, it's, it's the approach that's fundamentally wrong with, with, with that, not just the application and and not just the chemicals. The chemicals themselves work marvellously well. And, um, you know, even um, chlorpyrifos was, in, was a great control agent. Um, but the problem is that invariably there are stones, there's material under concrete slabs. We don't know what's there. There's levelling pegs in place. There's, um, and, and quite often there's concealed entry that we don't know about. And so the chemical approach, we shut off the obvious visible entry, but the concealed entry carries on. Mm. And of course, nothing can eliminate the colony like Centricon. I mean, you know, a lot of these products, they talk about how they can indirectly affect the nest. But it's Centricon. You know, we got termites feeding on baits we observe the colony in the tree being affected by that, by that centricon. We measured the decline of that colony in the tree. I then cut down the tree and dissected it to make sure that all activity had ceased. Everything had stopped. We know it eliminates the colony. There's nothing surer. It's not even dose specific. The more they eat, the quicker they die. But the fact is, if they consume the product, they will die. And, um, you know, and we know that that's the case. The only way to be absolutely certain the colony is eliminated is to um, feed them, okay. feed them the Centricon. Thanks, Shane. Well, you've got we've got all like... the other products relying on the research that was done for Centricon. Yeah. All right, we've got another six questions, so we'll continue to uh, go wow. on. Um, we have, I um, don't know if this is quite a question, but um, uh, termites also fight over control of a bait station, i.e. you may have coptotermies one month and shadowinos the next. Um, Absolutely, you might, yep. That's, that's right, you do. Yeah, keep, also, keep feeding. And on from that, um, in comparison to a bag of termite bait, how many grams are in an always active bait compressed rod? Now, um, it's actually not about the grams, it's about the potency. Um, Hexafluminine as an active ingredient is the most potent one on the market. So when you look at it in comparison to chlorofluoracuron, you need 
four to five times less volume of bait to eliminate a typical termite colony than what you would because of its potency. And the same again with now Valuron, um, that is not as potent as Centricon. So you, you do not need as many grams because it's all about the potency. Another question, um, is it okay to use always active at stage one curative treatment? For example, when you see a few small leads starting to breach the slab edge, placement of stations in soil adjacent to slab edge? Absolutely. Um, look, I'd be, I'd, I'd bait uh, entry points um, every time. And, um, uh, entry points, um, around entry points in slabs, often, yes, we'd put a cluster of in-ground stations with bait rods around that entry point. Um, often, you know, a small trench dug in a semicircle around, um, lined with stations uh, to intercept the colony coming. Um, we'd also fix above ground stations to the slab edge itself in that, in that situation. Absolutely. And um, going back to the previous one where, um, you know, oh, it could be coptotermies this month and it could be, you know, cheddaritotermies yeah. next month. I mean, that is the whole beauty of this approach. Absolutely. There's no other way you would be aware. There's no other way you'd be aware that there's two different species operating on the site. How else would you know mm -hmm. um, until we can see them and, and monitor them? And that just demonstrates how the termites do actually compete for food. You know, I've maintained, and I know that um, a lot of the scientific community says, no, termites aren't like, you know, lions on the, the plains, you know, trying to get into the other pride's territory to take their food. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, a fan of that idea. I believe that termites have soldier termites to defend themselves against predators, but mostly other termites. Because the number of times that we see the species change midway through a baiting program or Centricon program, the, the original colony is getting weakened and then they get taken over by another neighbouring colony. And we see it again and again and again. And, and this is the problem when um, people just take a curative approach and they say, oh, well, we baited it, we've killed the nest. Now we'll, we'll apply chemicals to keep them out of the house. Well, no, that's, that's not the... That's not the way to go because um, you're now um, corrupting the site, if you like. You're polluting the site and you're going to make it harder to find the termites in, you know, next summer when, when the ne next colony comes along yeah. and, um, and attacks the building. All right. The whole reason we do regular inspections is because things change. It's not static. The termite issue is not static. It, um, it's constantly moving and fluid. Okay, all right. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, good, 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 good response. Um, next question is: If I have a property that has conducive areas only on one on one side only and has very dry soil on the other, should I deploy stations on that damp side, likely more than one every three meters? To comply with labelling, do I have to deploy stations on the new non-conducive side? Do you deploy stations in non-conducive areas? Um, well, my thoughts on that is, you know, our label is that you have to, you, you, as a minimum, you place stations, if you're doing a full installation, you pla place stations one every three metre around the structure to be protected. Um, so, yes, if you're installing a full perimeter uh, installation, they should be every three metres. There's no need to bring them in any, any further, but as we said, that is, um, it is a minimum, so you've got to look for those conducive areas on top of that minimal around the structure protection. Shane, got anything further to input on that? Oh, well, yeah, the, the look, certainly um, you've got to find and recognise the damp areas and, um, and put additional stations and follow, you know, look at the site and say, well, where is the water going to go? Because the termites invariably follow the water. Um, so, Certainly, um, you know, every opportunity um, to put stations in. If I'm baiting a dry area, um, putting in-ground stations in a dry area, well then, you know, that's where you really need to do more to get them into the station and keep them in the station. So, 
you know, the idea of bulking up around the outside of the station by using the old MDs around the exterior of the station, putting hardwood mulch around the station, you know, the idea of that is to make that station more of a feeding site rather than a, you know, just a site where they're traveling through. And, and then if you, you know, remove the bait rod, um, and inadvertently disturb termites in the bottom of the station, well then, if it's bulked up, they're more likely to stay close to the station and come back into the bait rod. But if it's just a plastic station in dry ground with nothing around it, and then you're coming along to service that site, and you, you, you know, like if I'm servicing an in-ground station, I'll put my hand on the station to make sure it doesn't turn when I remove the lid because I don't want them to turn in the ground. I very carefully remove the lid. I'll look in the station before I touch anything or move anything very carefully, look in the station for any sign of, of termites. It's in there before I touch it. And then if I'm gonna remove the bait rod, I'm gonna remove it very, very carefully and, and examine that for um, evidence of termites. Because what I've found is that people go along, oh, checking the station, check the bait rod, open it up, rip it out, run there, all are in there, clean out all the rubbish, put the bait rod back in and it all looks beautiful and move on to the next site. And all they've done is actually disturb termites in the bottom of the station and make them go away from that station. So by taking the approach of a hunter and saying, no, no, let's, be re let's take some time and be very careful about how that's done. Then often um, we find the termites, you know, when they're just starting in the bottom of that station and allow feeding to, to occur naturally, you know, a more natural presentation, if you like, um, is going to catch more, um, more, more termites. Yeah. I see um, terrace houses there have been raised. Yeah. And um, look, terrace houses statistically get termites every eight to 15 years, right? They suffer a termite attack every eight to 15 years. A terrace house is what I call a multi-family dwelling. So it's one big house that lots of people live in. And, you know, from a starting point, whenever I'm brought into a terrace house, I say to them, listen, we need to treat the entire row like one house that lots of people live in. We should be, it is one building after all. You know, otherwise it's like, looking at a freestanding house and saying, well, we're just going to look at the sunroom. Now that would be negligent. And yet that's what people seem to do in terrace houses. So, you know, but we look at our options with terrace houses. I mean, what is the point of applying chemicals to the soil under a terrace house if they can gain entry to the roof from the neighbouring property? I mean, there's no logic in that. And again, if termites are gaining visible entry in the subfloor of a terrace house or coming up through a joint in a slab in a terrace house, why would we want to stop that or affect that with chemicals? Because the next time the termites come, they're going to come somewhere else and they're going to be really hard to find. And so, you know, with a terrace house, it requires more inspections. It requires cooperation with the neighbours. If that's not happening, then the homeowner has to accept the greater risk involved. You know, so instead of inspecting it two or three times a year, but six times a year where they're going over the place from bottom to top. <coughs> because, <coughs> excuse me, because you just don't know where they're going to, where they're going to appear. And all of the tools like our moisture meters and our bore scopes and cutting traps to look between floors and um, getting insulation um, moved in roofs so that we can see what's going on, about getting uh, cooperation from neighbours um, with terrace houses, about getting cooperation from the local council to allow us to um, uh, look at the uh, trees running up and down the, the street. All of these things become um, absolutely, um, absolutely critical. Thanks, Shane. Okay, next question. When installing an above ground station, is there a right or wrong way to pierce a jet rock slash timber slash surface 
to allow termite entry to the bait matrix, uh, such as filling a four metre hole, is that better than a six metre hole? Any recommendations, um, any tips for getting termites feeding on above rounds during cool conditions? No. <laughs> There's no hard, fast, no hard and fast rules. Um, variation is the key. Um, uh, certainly getting termites out of Giprock. I've achieved feeding when I've just found a fleck of mud on the surface of the wall and I've, I, I glue my station on there with put no bait in it, I put the station on the wall, attach with no more gaps, allow that to cure and dry. And then I've mixed up the mud nice and wet and put it into that station and sealed it all up. And I haven't made any piercing whatsoever into the termite galleries. I've just purely relied on the moisture soaking through that mud that's on the surface and the termites have come in and fed. On other sites, I've done that and it's completely failed. And next to it, I've put an AG station where I've cut quite a large hole into the wall and then push the bait in so it's oozing into the termite galleries themselves and I've achieved feeding. And so what I say is that it's just like fishing. You know, when we go fishing today, it might be, you know, they're biting on prawns. Tomorrow, they might be biting on, they might com completely ignore prawns. You might have to use something else entirely. And it's exactly the same with termites, that the behavior will change um, depending on what that colony needs and wants and depending on the conditions on that site and the species involved and uh, how mature the nest is, how far away it is, it varies from site to site. And so I say, no, there's no hard and fast rules, just like with fishing. No, we try something different every time. You know, we try a range of installations. Sometimes I've um, had uh, termites feeding and I'm on dry bait. Uh, other times uh, it's got to be really wet. Other times, make a big hole. Other times, a small hole. Um, but when I'm looking for AG sites, I prefer to find a spot where the termites are going from something to something else already. So if the termites, for example, are tracking along a top plate on a wall, at the end of that top plate where suddenly there's a bit of mud there and they're moving from one top plate to another, then that's where I'll put the, the station. Um, but look, you've just got to try everything. The biggest, the biggest problem I have, I go out, people say, oh, look, I just can't get feeding on this site. I go out and I go, well, you've, got, you've only got two baits. Like, put, put 10 in and tell me you can't get them feeding. You know, do a variety of um, installations. Now, I know they're expensive. Right, I know they're expensive, but there's nothing wrong with um, removing an, an AG from, from a site or removing bait from a site and using it next door or moving it from one part of the house to another part of the house. There's nothing, um, nothing wrong with that at all. But, you know, we've got to actually be uh, proactive and not just waiting for a response. We need to, um, we need to actually try different things. And sometimes it's just weird, you know, the one that they take. Like, I've seen sites where we couldn't get termites feeding on the bait. We couldn't get termites feeding on bait. And I've had the technician has prepared a bag of bait, right? He's actually put it on the gyp rock in the middle of the ceiling where there's no evidence of termites at all. And he's forgotten it. They left it there. The insulations were put down over the top and completely forgotten it. We've gone back in a month and the termites have built a mud lead from the wall out into the middle of the ceiling on the, on the gyp rock and they've eaten the bag of bait that just got dropped inadvertently, you know, on, the, on there. So, you know, there's no hard and fast rules. I've been to other sites and looked at, well, you know, I remember saying to one of my guys, um, Mark, one time, I looked at this bait on a fence and I said, Mark, like, what were you expecting? That's like, it's falling off. Like, you know, are you serious? And then when I opened the lid, the termites had eaten that bait. So it, it is... You know, that's, that's the fun part of, um, of this approach. It's just as much fun as fishing. And mm -hmm. just like the fish, they can sometimes just jump into the boat. <laughs> and, and the, uh, you know, the, and other times they can be just really hard to find. 
and, and sort out what's going on. But that's why we're professionals. You know, that's why um, Centricon isn't sold in hardware stores because it requires this skill to, um, to be successful. Thanks, Shane. Okay, next question is, what is your preferred method for killing termite colonies in trees? Well, I think I know that one. Above well, ground? yeah. <laughs> I put, um, well, I put, I like, I use above ground baits on trees all the time. I use above ground baits on the trees. So I drill a hole in the tree. Um, there's termites in it. I'll replug the hole, then install the station onto the tree, get it cured, then unplug the hole again and have nice runny bait running down that hole into the tree and, um, and get feeding. Um, also uh, commonly find termites in the base, in the ground at the base of the tree that my little dog will dig them up and there they are and I'll just put bait straight on that um, activity or mudding at the base of the tree, break it open, there they are, install bait uh, straight onto that activity. And, um, but I've also had sites where um, S says the termites are in the tree, but no matter how many holes we drill in the tree, particularly large trees, we can't find any um, activity within the tree. And so we'll install a ring of stations around the drip line of the tree, a ring of in-ground stations with bait rods around the drip line of the tree and then often intercept them or often just put a trench if we think, well, there could be a, a colony in that tree um, we can't detect, then we'll put a trench between that tree and the structure and um, fill that with mulch and line that with in-ground stations. But, okay. you know, no tree should be discounted. I've been made to look silly uh, many times. Um, and one, one that springs to mind was a job we did a long time ago um, during our trials, our original trials with Centricon and we're going along and, and my dog was indicating on a uh, Alexander palm and um, I had no termites feeding on my in-ground stations and I said to the client, listen, I'm, you know, I've never seen them in an Alexander palm, you know, I don't, I really don't think, you know. And the client phoned me up um, two days later to say that the Alexander palm had fallen over broken in half on the fence and the termites were flying out of the end of it. Well, you know, from that moment on, I decided not to rule out any tree. And, um, but yeah, no, I definitely do not promote the idea of using chemicals in trees because the problem is when we flood chemicals into a tree, we don't know if that nest is a primary colony or a secondary colony. So if we kill it with a liquid and it happens to be a secondary colony and the main nest is in another tree nearby or in higher up the tree where we can't access it or further down in the ground where we can't access it. Um, and we use chemicals and all we're doing is um, removing what's visible to us. And we've got no evidence that we've actually killed the entire colony. You know, and depending on well, what product is used, even, you know, in the days when... Um, Phil was promoting, Phil Hadlington was promoting the idea of using permethrin dust in colonies. I dusted colonies with permethrin dust and found that, you know, secondary colonies would suddenly become a parrot in the house because all the reproductives and termites would move out of the nest and, in, and, and, and build themselves a bivouac in the, in the structure. So, no, I don't like using liquid chemicals anywhere um, and I particularly don't like using them in trees for that reason. By baiting the termites in the tree, I know I'm going to kill the whole system, not just that particular nest or secondary nest. Yeah. All right, thanks Shane. Um, we are just gone over the hour, so maybe we'll just have one question more and then, um, yeah, or, or just maybe do some a little bit more, uh, you know, quickly. And then um, any that we haven't answered, we certainly um, can get back to you on those. So. Just the, the next one is um, just how far back from the old chemical barrier can you put a new bait station around a house or a building? Um, so basically, so it's not in the chemically treated zone. Our label, uh, well, label states three to 500 mil out, but not in a chemically treated zone. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Shane? Look, um, 
if the house has been previously uh, treated with chemicals, certainly um, I'm putting the baits much further away from the foundation wall than that, um, if I can. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want them anywhere near um, where termites or where chemicals have been been before, because there's often um, uh, they'll go in and there's just a reluctance to feed. Um, yeah. So the the further away, the better from um, um, previous chemical previous yeah. chemical you treatment. Want, yeah, you want to minimise any risk of um, obviously delaying or um, extending time to get the termites feeding to achieve elimination. So. Definitely. Okay, next question. Those termites that get taken over, are they killed by a new colony or do they become part of the new colony? Oh, I think they're killed by the new colony. But we have had sites, incidentally, where we've eliminated the termites with Centricon. Then we've had another infestation of termites come into that building. And before we could achieve feeding on actual bait within the building, the termites have begun to show signs of being affected by the IGR. And they've in fact then died before they've actually eaten any new, um, any new uh, Centricon. And so um, they're just picking up the IGR from the dead termites in the system that they're consuming, I believe. And um, by reworking, a lot of the time we find that, uh, you know, they're reworking the material and, and becoming affected. Okay. All right. So um, I see Sorry. Byron saying, what if we use Termidor? Well, I just say don't. <laughs> um, because that, that will affect the behaviour of the termites and will just conceal um, activity in the future. We don't want chemicals like that anywhere near the property, really. Okay. All right. I'll try and get through these. Um, um, in your experience, what is a... Well, we've had that one, sorry. Um, okay. So is the active as good on Lashuda termes as well? Um, my response to that would be, well, we know that the shooter termies um, often have very large colonies with a lot of mature workers, so they're not molting and they consume an awful lot of uh, bait. Um, so just be prepared to bait them for quite a long time. Um, and I know, Shane, obviously where you live, you've probably got nashutes everywhere. Um, so. Look, with that, um, you know, nashuta um generally I mean, to begin with, they're a lot less destructive um, than, than the main target species. But, um, and generally they have a, a visible mound. Now, often, you know, we go to sites uh, and, and, and there's Nasuda termies on site and then suddenly people are like lowering their recommendation. You know, they're, they're just saying, oh, let's just kill that nest or remove it physically, which is often the best way with Nasuda termies is just to dig it up and take it away in the back of the truck, you know, or do a localised application to the actual colony itself. Um, but just physically um, removal, you know, of that nest. But we've got to be saying to those clients that, look, just because we can see nasutotermies here doesn't mean that's the, all that's here. You know, we should still be recommending a full program, even if it's a little nest, oh, we can just dig that out and we'll take it away. We should still be recommending the full installation of Centricon because there may well be other termites there on site, which we're not aware of. So, you know, certainly with, um, with Nasuda termies, um, they can feed for a long time and it can be frustrating if you can't find the nest. You know, 99 times in 100, you should be able to locate the colony and remove it directly. Okay, cool. Thanks, Shane. Okay, the next one is uh, species related as well. How effective is Centricon for heterotermies? Ah, oh, well, again, um, you know, it takes a certain amount of finesse to get them feeding, of course. Um, heterotermies are quite, you know, finicky and yep. um, as, as a species. And so, you know, and this is where how you 
service the sites really is so important about, you know, not just ripping the bait rods out, looking at them and shoving them back in and running the drill in and out to clean the station every time, you know. Heterotermies um, can be a little bit finicky, but it's highly effective. Centricon is highly effective on, on heterotermies. And if, um, you know, AG baits, a place like the old paling fence situation, you know, with the heterotermies coming up the paling fence, Highly effective just to stick a station towards the end of one of those leads and let them go in and have a bit of a feed. They might only eat, you know, 15 or 20% of a station or a bait rod and then that colony will be eliminated. But yeah, they do require finesse, if you like. Whereas, um, you know, historically with Shedderine and Termies, we were always told that they would just abandon and disappear at the slightest disturbance. But in fact, you know, my experience with Shedderine and Termies is that if you just drop bait somewhere nearby, they're going to eat it, you know. And once they're feeding on the bait, we can just remove the bags and replace them without fear that the termites are going to abandon that um, station at all. But of course, they will feed for an extended period of time because instead of having, you know, like with copter termies, you might have one or two satellites or secondary colonies with Shedderana termies, there might be eight or nine um, colonies attached to that system. And so the feeding will often go on for an extended period of time. And, you know, we've seen sites where they're fed for 12 months or 18 months, and we've got the stations, above ground stations stacking up and, um, and so much bait being consumed. And of course, it's a concern for the client. But what we know and what we've found is that once they start feeding on the Centricon, it becomes their primary food. And that quite often with Shedderina termies, they'll have fed on the bait, the colony is eliminated. And what we've got are these, and this is the same with Nasutatermies, what we've got are these old, geriatric termites wandering around the system, still feeding on bait, just waiting to die. Now, an individual termite can live for quite, you know, a period of time. And so that can linger and go on and go on and go on. And I have um, had sites where the only place we could find live termites was still in those stations. And actually after, you know, 12 months of feeding, we've removed the bait and given them wood and then they die. The adults, in fact, were only surviving because they were able to eat the Centricon. And once, once we removed it, they starved to death. Yeah. yeah, but the species is critical, you know, just like catching different species of fish. If I'm gonna catch flathead, I take a different approach than if I'm chasing brim or dewfish. And it's just the same. This is why, you know, we can't be prescriptive with this approach. We can't just, say, well, there's a label, I've done this, and now it has to work. We can't just be relying on a product. And, you know, so much of our termite management fails, uh, no matter what approach we're using, because people just want to be able to rely on a product. They want to be able to just say, look, if I do this, and I read that, and then I just shove them in there that, and I don't have, I can sleep at night. I don't have to worry. Now that's, we've got to get away from that. And we've got to say, yeah, look, the label is there, yes. And the, the recommendation is there, yes. But that is a starting point. That's where we begin. And a termite management program has to be progressive and it has to be constantly being adjusted. And that's why we're there. We're not just there to look in the green things in the ground. I mean, the customer can do that themselves if they wanted to. You know, we're there because we're adding more stations. We're removing stations. We're, we're adjusting the site and, and acting, you know, uh, to, to find those termites and, and eliminate them. We've got to be on the front foot. We've got to be chasing them down. We've got to be finding them and aggressively going after them. All right, uh, next, uh, next question, sorry, is obviously opening a station disrupts activity, even, even if you take care. What is your recommendation on keeping termites in a disrupted station? I mean, well, all the, by, yeah. um, I mean, we, all I was going to reply to that is, you don't actually need to remove the actual bait rod itself. Um, you can use a torch and, and a cake, cake skewer just to, um, 
uh, test the integrity. It's normally pretty evident if termites are in that station. And um, yeah, I tend to use a uh, cake skewer to test the integrity of the rod, you'll soon find out. But what we did, what I do see a lot with the rods, um, not so much the old central bait too, but with the rods, and, and this is with Shedderina termes as well, you know, which we know are shy and skittish, is that um, normally, because they, as Shane said, they feed on um, the rod as a preferential food source, um, and they prefer higher quality food source, they tend to hit the stations very robustly. So there's galleries leading up to that station, there's plenty of pheromones leading around the station. And um, we saw very little issues with, um, with abandon with the, with the bait rods. But Shane, you know. Well, you know. originally, if we look back at the, at the first trials we did with Centricon, when we had the timbers in the stations and we were replacing those with the bait rods, we found that or with the, with the bait tube as it was then, abandonment was a big issue. And then um, following uh, Warwick, Warwick Lucas's advice, we then put two monitoring devices on the outside of the station. Now, just by doing that, just by putting two monitoring devices on the outside of the station, the abandonment, the abandonment rate was halved, halved. And so I'm still a big proponent of bulking the stations up. Now, if we look at, a, at the environment, so if we look at, if we compare two stations, we've got one that's in a shady area, a shady damp area under a tree. Now, if the termites abandon the bait rod, they're much more likely to stay close to the station which means they're much more likely in the future to re-enter the station. But if we look at a station, another station might be in a, the middle of a dry, hot lawn, fully exposed to the sun, very dry, very hot. Now, if that station is there all alone and there's no moisture or timber around and there happen to be termites in that station, they will much more readily abandon that station. So if we remove that bait rod, they'll, they'll go off way over there to buggery away, right? So by bulking up the outside of those stations, particularly are those hot, dry ones, by putting mulch and hardwood timber around that station, then if, they, if we remove the bait rod and we go, oh, look at that, there were just a few termites in the bottom, well, they're more likely to keep feeding adjacent to the station in the, in the MDs, in the old monitoring devices on the exterior of the station, we're in the mulch right there. And then we put the bait rod back in, they're much more likely to come in and, and keep feeding. But yeah, um, it depends on the, on the situation. But when I open a station, even if it's full of soil, I think, well, that's good, it's full of soil. The bait rod's just poking out the top. I'll just tap on the top of the bait rod. Oh yeah, well, that's still solid. I can't push it down, it's not collapsing. I'll leave it alone. You know, I'm only gonna, I'm only going to remove that bait rod if there's other pests in there that I want to get rid of. But if it's full of soil and that is in contact with the bait rod, well, that just increases the likelihood of a hit. It's a more natural um, presentation. But if we're going there every month and ripping it out and cleaning the station out with a drill and it looks good, the client thinks, oh, wow, they're doing good things. It actually has a negative outcome. We're better off to leave it alone, be careful. We, we look in, we're tapping the top of the bait rod. Oh yeah, that sounds good. It's still solid, all right. Well, there's no, ant, there's no ants, there's no other things in there. Well, let's just close it up and leave it. Okay, all right, thanks Shane. And okay, we've got one last question. Um, when stations are installed in concrete, what are your bulking recommendations here? Oh, well, again, um, under concrete, I mean, concrete and pavers are so conducive to termites because, you know, the concrete slab holds the moisture in the ground. It's always damp under a concrete slab. So if termites are under a concrete slab, they're quite likely to be foraging everywhere. They're going to love it under there. It's warming up. You know, they're particularly good in the wintertime um, because it provides the warmth that they want. 
and they're quite likely to be foraging anywhere. But the problem you see a lot of the time is you've got a big hole in the concrete and then you've just got a bait rod or a station rattling around in there and there's no physical contact with the soil and the station and the bait rod. So again, um, I certainly like to have that, you know, we draw, core the hole um, and we put a station in and there is, um, it is bulked up absolutely bulked up. I mean, if every station can be bulked up on the exterior of the station, then it didn't do it. It, it works. Um, and it will definitely become, you know, more of a feeding site and, and bait consumption increases because, because it's a feeding site. Because of the material on the outside, they eat the bait quicker. So it's not just that you get more termites in the station's feeding, you actually get the bait being consumed faster because they're there to eat. You know, whereas if you've got the station in the hot, dry lawn and it's not bulked up, they're not there to eat. They're there to get to the next tree. You know, they're looking for shade because under the shade of the tree is where the fallen limbs are that, <coughs> that the termites are looking to, to clean up. So, you know, often they'll go into the station, but it's not a feeding site. You think, God, they're in there, but they're not eating. Why aren't they eating? Well, it's because it's not a feeding site. But if we bolt it up with decayed timber around that station, they're gonna, it's going to become a feeding site and they're much more likely to consume the centricon. Okay, thanks, Shane. Um, okay, um, yeah, I think that was it. Well, well no, there's one more. Um, what do you think about using the bait rod inside an above ground station? Um, okay, well, the how, I don't know how to address this one. Okay, so the rods um, uh, on the label says they may, must remain in an in-ground station. Um, we did do a few trials in above grounds, but um, the actual above ground station is registered for the pelletized bait in it. Um, and the reason why we stuck with that is because we do like when the bait in an above ground situation needs to be obviously um, water solution or a wetting solution introduced so that the bait is generally pliable and you can squeeze it into the termite working and it acts as wick and draws it in. Um, you know, the, the, the termite, termite side rods, they're dense and durable as we all know and we need that because they go in the ground and they last in the ground for many years where that's not applicable for the above ground situation. Um, in saying that, would they work? Probably, yep. Look, but uh, it's um, an active ingredient, so we we tried it. Um, certainly tried it, and um, but um, and and occasion we have had feeding on them in in AG stations. I have done that, um, but um, they're less. It's less effective to use the bait rods in the AG station. It's mm. just less effective because um, of their composition. The whole idea. Yeah, the whole idea of the above ground station is that if you can imagine the, the termites environment, they've got to maintain strict control over that environment. Hence all the mudding and the air conditioning and everything. We all know they do that. So they're very strictly controlling that environment. Now, when we put the AG on there, we want the environment inside the AG station to be the same as the environment inside the termite colony. So if we've just got a, a bait rod in there rattling around, it's not wet, right? Um, it's not gonna ooze into the workings. If we've got the um, bait mixed up, you know, and I like it like porridge and it's oozing into, there's more area touching, um, there's more uh, material, there's more centricon coming into contact with the termites than with a round rod. You know, there's only gonna be a tiny little part of that surface touching uh, the wall or the thing. It's just less, less effective. Um, it can, it, 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 it can, you can, you know, if you had nothing else, well then, you know, bung one in there and go back and Put the proper bait in, you know, as soon as you can. Um, but it's it's going to be um, less effective, okay, and right. not in accordance with the label. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Um, right, well, that was the last question. So I guess it is, we've gone quite uh, a way over, which I think is very encouraging. And uh, there's still quite a lot, there's still a lot of participants. So um, I assume that you've found this uh, to be very helpful. I'd like to uh, give a huge thank you to Shane. Well done. Thank you very much for uh, participating in this with me. And um, thank, thank you to all the participants for listening in and being proactive and asking lots of questions. Um, this is being recorded and it will be on our website. So um, if you do want to watch it again, um, I'm not quite sure on the time frame on that, but um, we can keep you posted. So everybody, thank you very much again and uh, look after yourselves and hope you're all keeping busy. Thank you. Take care. Take care Thanks, and stay man. safe and, and maybe we can do it again one day. Absolutely. Thank you. See you later, everybody.